frame in here. Get used to my new frame. Thank you, Lord. How are you? How's everybody doing? Praise God. Rainy day. I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still buzzing from I'm still buzzing from last Saturday. <laughs> because even when I watched the video of last Saturday's Sunset Fellowship for those who missed lesson 602. The Holy Spirit, and that's what, that's what this lesson is about, obedience. And that's the only reason and the only way I was able to catch the sunset at the ocean that we caught a few lessons ago, lesson 602, was when the traffic was backed up. The testimony is when the traffic was backed up, I started seeing all these wonderful cloud formations. I said, wow, I got to get these pictures of clouds. So between following the clouds and go trying to stop at every parking lot, but every parking lot was blocking the sun. There was always a building blocking the sun. So I had to just, just keep going west, keep going west. And soon there were no parking lots and there was the ocean. I said, wait a minute. Now look at what's in front of me. I'm going to be able to catch the sunset. So I just kept on driving. Forget about the parking lots. I can see the ocean. So when we got to the ocean at the right time to catch the sun just above the ocean and be able, and then the security guard allowing me to park in an employee parking space. Now that little favor started right there. The when excuse me, favor started when the traffic happened. Because if I'd gone home the way I normally gone home, we would not have seen anything on Saturday night. I would have been on the freeway going north, surrounded by mountains. So as soon as he said, "Don't worry about the, don't go this way home," and then I fell and fell and watched the clouds and all this. Stuff. I was overtaken by his His Majesty in clouds, and then the parking lots being the wrong angle that led me to the ocean and then the security guard let me park in an employee parking space cops passing me by left and right not a single one asked me would i work there not a single cop asked me a single thing they just passed right by see god's favor was all over saturday night i don't know about you guys i don't know what you, if you saw saturday night you know the presence of the lord was a, even his presence is always with us but something about saturday night was totally incredible as far as his peace really truly teaching us what peace beyond understanding really is. And so I and make that favorite, whatever you need to do, because I'm actually, Lord, Holy Spirit told me to actually also take that video and put music to it as well. So we have the lesson with that view. And then you're going to be having a video with different uh, several of my songs under the same thing, just overwhelming us with peace. Now, many of you know, as I left the sunset on my way home, the transmission of the car decided to go out. Now this is even God's victory was even there because I didn't have any idea there was anything wrong with the transmission. I was with I, I got I was about twenty miles from home where the sunset was. So when I got about two miles from the house, you know I said I, I got to throw the trash out of the car because I had some stuff in the car I needed to throw. So I turned to a parking lot to throw the gas to throw the, the trash away. But then when I went to leave the parking lot, reverse didn't work. I said, wait a minute now, how am I going to get out of here? Now, listen to the top of this lesson, obedience, right? Obedience is the key, right? So <laughs> I'm looking at the car. The car is facing the wrong way on a very slight incline. And I'm trying to, I'm only two miles away from home. But how am I going to get home if the car won't go in the reverse? Now, what does the Holy Spirit say? Well, push it back. Now, here, now here, here's where the flesh could take it over. Push the car back. But my, I, I just, my, I just had a knee replacement in my, in my back. You know, I, you know, I'm gonna, I got excuses. Holy Spirit said, push the car backwards, and then you can get it in the right direction. I had to push the car about seven feet. So I said, okay. Uh, now we have a Honda Pilot. We don't have a, like a, a Volkswagen. Push the S so the SUV back seven feet. Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. Okay. <laughs> I never, I kept that out. I said, okay, don't, don't worry about the knee. Don't watch it back. Holy Spirit said, push the car, push the SUV. And the SUV went back seven feet to allow me to get in the car, put it in drive, and get out of the parking lot to make it home. And the only parking space left was right across the street from our house. So I didn't have to, so I, I, we have one of those streets where everybody is in every parking space. So if you, if you don't get home in the afternoon, there is no parking space for you to park in. So not only did he help give me the strength to push the car back to get out of the parking lot, when I got home, the parking space that was open was right across the street from where we live. See, but what would have happened 
when the Holy Spirit said, push the car back. But you know what, Holy Spirit, you know, my, my back is not right yet. You know, and I just had a knee replacement. I don't know if my knee, see, I, see sometimes the Holy Spirit, and that's what this whole lesson is about. Sometimes the Holy Spirit tells us to do things and we get intellectual. Well, why? What? How, how am I going to do that? Don't ask questions. Holy Spirit tells you what to do. He's telling you what you need to do to get the victory. The victory was to get out of that parking lot. I'm only two way, two miles away. There's nobody in sight to ask for help. Nobody to help me push the car. Nobody in the car to back the car up. It was me, you and me, go, you and me, Lord. How am I getting out of this parking lot? Push the car. Push the car. Oh, push the SUV. Okay. Samson, Spirit of Samson, I need you right now. <laughs> and see, and it worked, and it got me out the it got not only got me out the parking lot, but got me home safely across the street from my house. Praise God. So that's a praise report of that entire day. And see, and see, I knew what was happening. As soon as it wouldn't go in reverse, I said, I know what this is. Devil trying to steal my joy because we just sat in two hours of anointing at the ocean, just filled with God's presence and that beautiful sunset we saw on Saturday night. And that's what I told you about. That's why we bind the spirits of retribution, revenge, retaliation, because they try to steal your joy. We came out of such a wonderful evening of just God's anointing, just floating, just floating through the, the spirit. I don't know about you. I'm still buzzing. I'm still buzzing from that. So no matter what the devil did to the car, my, my joy is as hot right now. As Saturday night, all through Sunday, all, all through pushing the car, and see, and so, so, this is what our lesson today, and that's what our lesson I put the lesson down is: <laughs> obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now that text, that actually text is is First Samuel fifteen twenty two. First Samuel fifteen twenty two. See God's favor when we're being obedient. God's favor is over us because we're being obedient. And the reason you say obedience is better than sacrifice, this is where people make the mistake. We make the mistake of thinking if we're doing things right for the Lord, then what can be better than that? Well, what can be better than that is doing what the Holy Spirit tells you to do when he tells you to do it. I could be saying, well, well, you know, I can't really push the car, but I go to church every Sunday and I tithe and I, and I, I give to the church and I give donations. I give and I give. I'm doing things for the Lord. But the Holy Spirit just told you to do something. And you're giving the Holy Spirit, you tell the Holy Spirit your checklist of what you've done for the Lord while he's telling you to do something. But you're not doing what he just said do. You're giving the Holy Spirit a checklist of all the good works you're doing, all the works you're doing. But wait, hold up. But the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you what to do to get you out of the situation you're in. He's not asking you for an explanation. He's not asking you for a checklist of all the things you do for God. He's trying to tell you what you need to do right now, right now, not tomorrow, not later, not two hours from now. He's trying to tell you what to do right now to get out of the situation you need to get out of, whatever it is. That's what the lesson was validated for me that Saturday night. I could have gone in my whole checklist about my back and my knees. How am I gonna do it? How am I gonna do it? I don't. I need some help. I need somebody to push me in the car. Holy Spirit said, push the car. Push the car, Holy Spirit. Physically, push the car. And the car moved. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So the that's just one example. We get examples, and you guys probably, as I said that, have some things come to your mind the Holy Spirit has told you to do, and you haven't done it yet. You see, that's the that's one of the, that's what the this one of the things we're praying for this week. Like last week, we were praying for letting things go, let the peace of God overtake us. And see, when we consecrate, consecrate, on a consecration fast, not only are we focusing on our body and things get healed and lose weight and eat right, we're trying to get the physicality, we're trying to get the temple together, but we also try to get our holiness together because there are things in this world that try to steal our holiness. Like we talk many times, coworkers can steal your joy, make you go ballistic, cuss somebody out. You got, you got coworkers, you got backstabbers, you got liars, you got cheaters, you got haters, unbelievers. These are the things in the world. These are the things in the world who are set in place to steal our joy. So when we're doing a fasting and praying period of time, we're asking for victory, not over just our physicality, but over the strength to stay in holiness, to not go off on somebody, to not lose our temper, to not cut somebody out, to not, not <laughs> knock somebody out who's trying to steal your joy, but to what? Hold your peace. Hold your peace. Peace. The, the, the warfare is not ours. The battle is not ours. 
It's a spiritual warfare we are a part of because we are spirit and God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. We're battling this world, but the Lord is moving things in the spirit in order to be victorious in this world. That's why we have to stay connected to the Lord to be able to be connected to the whole armor of God, connected to putting on the whole armor of God, the Psalm 91 protection, and to use the authority. The authority is not in our flesh. The authority is coming from the spiritual realm that gives us the protection and the deliverance and the healing we need when we need it, when we say, in the name of Jesus. When we say, in the name of Jesus, that prayer, that request is activated because Jesus said Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it because I go to the Father that the Father may be glorified. John 14, 12. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it because I go to the Father and the Father will be glorified. And then he repeats it. Whatever, again, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. But sometimes we forget that and we go into panic. We go into anxiety. We go into stress. We go into sleepless nights because we're trying to figure out how to do it. Use your authority. Don't know how to figure it out. Figured out is using the authority we've been given to be victorious over what we're dealing with. That's trying to pull us down. So that's that's the key. That's the key. When you when you're walking in victory in Jesus Christ, you got the boldness. You're not worrying about haters. Yeah, there will be haters because Jesus said, "Remember, if the world hates you, he hated me first. That's what Jesus told the disciples. Don't worry about how people react to you just because you love the Lord, you love Jesus. Well, I forgot who told me that. They said praise the Lord every morning at work, and they got fired. Human resources fired them for spreading the word. By saying praise God, God bless you, that's, that's pushing the word on people, and the person got fired for saying God bless you every morning. See, that's what we're dealing with in this world. That's what we're dealing with in this world, but that's why we keep praising because see, we know, we know when you go to work or you go to school or you go to any, anytime you're dealing with any people in the flesh, in a workforce, in another environment where you're going to be dealing with all kinds of spirits around you. You got to, as I say this worth repeating, you've got to walk in there prayed up. Don't walk in any place not prayed up when you're going to be coming in contact with all kinds of of spirits. You don't know what people, the person sitting next to you might be an atheist, might have a demonic spirit, and you walk in there not prayed up, and all of a sudden they steal your joy because they're there to steal your joy. But you didn't pray when you left. You got up out of bed, you got dressed, you went to work, and all of a sudden they say something to you and you lost your temper because you didn't walk out the door prayed up. The devil's just waiting to see if you prayed up because if you're not prayed up, he's going to knock you off your feet. And now you're like, what happened today? This day was terrible. The other day was terrible because you didn't start the day off with the Lord, whether it's fellowship or not. When you open your eyes, thank you, Jesus, for another day. Praise God. Bless this day, Lord. That's even before fellowship. As soon as you get out of bed, thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for the victory of this day. Speak life into your day as soon as you open your eyes and get out of bed. Start your day as soon. Because you, some people didn't wake up to say that. Some people did not wake up to even say that. So that's the first reason you're happy. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Because a lot of people didn't see this day that they thought they were going to see. And that's what we sing. That's why I sing, save me. You save me. You, we're here for a reason. Every one of you that can hear my voice, this is not an accident you hear. You're not here by accident. God doesn't do anything by accident. You're all here for a reason. You may not understand the divine reason yet. But one reason, the one thing I guarantee <laughs> The one reason you're all here is to let your light shine. That's the I, I tell you that that's the first reason you're here is to let your light shine in whatever environment you're in, wherever you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what the workplace is like, to let your light shine and to let God do the rest. Let your light shine. Let God do the rest. Have no fear. Let God do the rest. Hold your peace. Let God do the rest. The Lord will fight for you and you shall what? Hold your peace. Peace, Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Don't get twisted. Don't get upset. Don't let them steal your joy. Woosa. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Yes, Lord. You got this. You got this. That knuckle steal my joy. I just came from lunch and they said something to me. I want to smack somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. Just saying that just five, those 10 seconds, I just felt peace just now when I said that. Because there's something about that name. Whenever you're at your workplace, uh, Jennifer in London was telling me, 
I don't have time to be, be still. I don't have time. I said, you could be sitting at your work desk and in the midst of chaos, look look down like you're reading and just say, thank you, Jesus. I'm not, my eyes not even closed. I'm looking like I'm looking at a book, but what I'm really saying in my spirit, thank you, Jesus. Help me with this peace of mind. I need peace of mind right now, Jesus. I need you right now, Lord. Touch me right now, Lord. That's what you're saying, but you're looking down. They think you're reading the book. You guys, you're actually worshiping. You're in stillness worshiping in the middle of the chaos all around you. If you cannot get to a physical place for peace of mind, your peace of mind is where you are. When you start talking to Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Help me right now. Help me pull through this. I need you right now. I need I need organization. I need peace. I need to sell my spirit right now, Lord. These people are driving me crazy. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. About 30 seconds of that, you ready to go on the rest, rest of your day praising. Amen? So now, Samuel, now just to reverse why, where the scripture from uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 22, 15, 22. And Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of God? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of the rams. Verse 33, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Of course, we're talking about Samuel's word to King Saul at the time, but the meaning of that to us in everyday life is rebellion. See, when the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, Holy Spirit is telling you to do something and you don't do it, that's actually a spirit of rebellion. Because the Holy Spirit just told you to do something and you didn't do it. Now, sometimes we think rebellion means, I'm not going to do that. No, disobedience is a form of, re of rebellion because you've just been given an instruction and you didn't do it. Now, I'm not I'm, talking, I'm not just preaching the choir. I'm preaching myself as well to always remember this. That's what I think that was my test coming home because that was the that was the direct application of this lesson. Even before I knew this was a lesson I was going to preach, <laughs> I just suddenly realized as I wrote down the title, that's how I got home Saturday night. Obedience. Don't worry about how much, how much, how many, don't worry about how many golden nuggets you've done. You want to get home. So what you need to do right now is push, push the truck. And that's an example of obedience is better than sacrifice because the obedient part is what's happening to you right now that you need to obey. To get there. For, for example, when, uh, uh, when Isaac took his son up to the mountain, I need, I need a sacrifice. Now, so what if what if what if Isaac said, "Well, you know, I, I only got my son. Well, how how, how am I going to kill my son? You ask, you need a sacrifice." Did did did, Isaac, did he say that? Did Isaac say that? He didn't say a word. He just was obedient to the Lord. Okay, Lord, you need a sacrifice. Okay, right now, all I've got is my son. But you say, "Go up and uh, you need a sacrifice." So I'm sure this isn't written down because it's his, it's his own thoughts. But can you imagine? You going up to give a sacrifice, and you know you need something living. And in those days, to sacrifice something, you need something to sacrifice—a living something to sacrifice on the altar for the Lord. And if your son, his son, was the only thing living at that time with him, as he's going to fulfill the orders of the Lord, then he needs a sacrifice. And of course, once he laid his son and got ready to take the knife up, God stopped him, and behold, what there was a ram in the bush to replace his son with. But what was being tested, are you obedient in everything I ask you to do or just some things? See, that's how sometimes God tests us. Some of our tests are to see, are we really going to be obedient or are we going to figure out a way not to do it? And see, that's that's what, because the doing of the thing the Holy Spirit tells us to do is where the victory is, is where the leads us to whatever we need to do to get over that challenge in case. Now, of course, disobedience also. When Lot, the angels, the angels of the Lord told Lot to take his family, leave Sodom, and flee. Flee. And don't look back. But what did Lot, what did Lot's wife do? She had to turn around and see how the city was going to be destroyed. And when she turned around, she turned into what? A pillar of salt. Because the orders were flee the city. And don't look back. 
It don't matter what, don't worry about how God's going to do it. If God says go forth and don't look back. See, that's, that's, that's what lean not to our own understanding means. Lean not to your own understanding means we get intellectual, we get a direction from the Lord, and we look back. See, but how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Don't worry how you're going to do that. If he says, I will give you the victory, he's going to give you the victory. Trust him with all your heart. Lean not to your understanding. Don't worry about how he's going to do it. Trust him and do what he says do. And that's the key to what we're praying for this entire week. This focus for this entire week of the, of the fast is as we continue to pray for other things we want to be victorious over, is to pray to be obedient to the Holy Spirit at every turn. Obedient at every turn. Okay, man? Now, that's First Samuel 15. Now, one of my, my other great examples of being obedient. See, uh, turn to Judges. Judges chapter 7, I'll tell you one. This is the story of Gideon. And a lot of you who know the story of Gideon uh, in Judges, we'll talk about that in just a minute. The phone trying to go off. Uh, you go ahead. Now, Gideon, of course, was in the Judges. In the book of Judges, of course, was people going back and forth in a cycle that seemed like they needed a judge to help them stay focused on the, the love of the Lord. Because when there was no judge, the people automatically went into idol worship. So over and over again in the book of Judges, a judge was appointed from time to time to help people get focused on the Lord, love the Lord, give them the victory, and they love the Lord. But the problem was, every time the, a judge would die, the people would forget about all the miracles of the Lord and go back to idol worship, and then the Lord would have to, do, to, to give them an awareness test and let them be caught by some enemy. And then all of a sudden, while they're being oppressed by an enemy, they start calling for the Lord again. He would deliver them, give them another judge. And this was a cycle in the entire book of Judges of people continuously forgetting the goodness of the Lord and going back to idol worship. So now, Gideon, verse uh, uh, chapter, now what I want you guys to read, I'll be jumping, this is two long chapters, but I want you to write down, read all of chapters 7 and all of chapter 8. Because in our fasting this month, and the reason the Holy Spirit said this is our, our test, our obedience is the focus of this week, is in our fasting of this month, the Holy Spirit is going to be telling us to do some stuff to help adjust what we need to do to be victorious. He's going to be telling us, well, you need to do, make sure you do this, make sure you do that, which is helping us achieve what we wrote down. And a lot of you have already done that under Lesson um, uh, 594. Under Lesson 594 is, for those who haven't done it, under Lesson 594, write down the thing you want to be victorious over while you're doing the fasting this month, a 30-day fast. Now, now, during this time of pushing to get to that victory is when all the challenges uh, would try to do, well, maybe I'll do this instead. Well, well why are you going to do that instead? Because you're trying to push through this thing. When you're trying to push through it, you, you're focusing on what it is you laid on, your, on the altar, wrote down on your list, and all the things, either way you eat, the way you pray, all the things that you got to put in line to make it through the 30 days of what you're fasting for, for the victory. Now, during about the halfway point, we're about at the halfway point, I want you guys to write down, we'll talk about it at the end of the fast, journal what you're feeling during this period of time. Because see, what happens is when you read Look back at it. Well, you know, day four was hard because I kept craving this. Well, day, day five was really hard because I kept thinking about this. Why was I thinking about that? Because you were retraining your spirit to not think about things that were distracting you. What is causing you to think about some of the things? Is it something you're watching? Is it some of the things that you're being around? See, we have to evaluate people, things, activities, thoughts, all the things that make us entertain thoughts that pull us away from God. If you don't pay attention to what that is, it'll keep sneaking up on you. And next thing you know, why was I thinking that? Because you entertained that thought and you gave that thought life. And now you can't get out your head because you entertained the thought or the person or the activity or the memory. See, when we're putting, we're capturing every stronghold, like the Bible, like the Bible says, capture every stronghold. I'm paraphrasing. That's not like God. As soon as it comes to your mind, Capture it. Don't sit there and entertain that thought because as soon as it comes into your thought, you either accept it or you rebuke it. You accept it by, you know what? I haven't done that in a while. Now, once you just said, I haven't, now you entertain the thought. If it's something you know you shouldn't be thinking about comes into your mind, I rebuke that thought in the name of Jesus right now. 
I rebuke that thought. Get it out of my head, Lord. Take it out of my head. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not remembering that because that is trying to steal my joy right now. Some thought, some memory, some person, something, anything that tries to come into your present life to try to steal your joy. Amen. That's what we have to try to make through. We stay focused on. Hey, Diago, welcome. So that's why we have to always make sure we're focused. That's what the focus part is. To focus on being obedient because as we pray each day, as you stand still, stillness, should, other than fellowship, even when you're doing your fasting and praying on your own, stillness should still be a major part of your prayer time because that's when we hear the Holy Spirit giving us the directions of what we need to do for the current situation to get out of. Amen. So that's part of it. Now, in Gideon's case, for those new, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing these two chapters because we don't have enough time to read these two chapters. But Gideon was, well, Gideon was appointed to be a judge over the people. But he had a very interesting way of getting there. Because first, God had to let him know that he was chosen. And he didn't believe he was chosen because he's thinking all these, he's thinking, well, uh, me? Are you sure you want me? So an angel of the Lord appeared before him in verse, uh, let me go back. Uh, this is uh, Judges. Verse 7, uh, chapter 7. Uh, let's look at that. Um, let's start at, actually, verse 6. I'm sorry, chapter 6. Starts at chapter 6, verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. See, see, sometimes before the Lord uses us in an assignment, he has to actually let us know that you have what it takes to do the assignment he's given you. The Holy Spirit will never give you something to do, not let you know you can do it, and then leave you high and dry. If he's giving you an assignment, he's going to be letting you know the whole way, yeah, you're going to be victorious in this assignment. Don't get don't get intellectual, but how are we going to do that? No. Wipe that phrase out of your mind. When the Holy Spirit comes to your mind, wipe that phrase. How are we going to do that? Don't even entertain that phrase. Don't even entertain that question because... The Holy Spirit is going to let you know how you're going to do that because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Now, in verse 20, the verse 20, this is when the angel first came before Gideon to let him understand the first time the assignment. The angel of the Lord came to him, verse 20, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay it on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Verse 21, then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meal and the leavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Two things. <laughs> A being appears, does this wondrous work in front of you and then vanishes. Now, the first thing Gideon said in verse 22, when the angel, when Gideon saw the angel of the Lord, he said, alas, the Lord, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Now see, this is almost like the doubting Thomas syndrome. God had to kind of show Gideon who he was so he could use him the way he wanted to use him. Because Gideon, first thing, by him saying, now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then verse 33, the Lord said to him, peace to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. And then Gideon builds an altar where the whole thing took place and went there. Now, as you read later in this chapter, then God gives him an assignment that he's going to help deliver the people. He's going to help deliver the people. <laughs> now, here he goes again. He He's given an assignment to help deliver the people. How am I going to hear it? How am I going to deliver the people? We got Now, let's jump down to um, um, verse 36. Now, between why you stopped and between um, up to 36, the, the word was found out that two tribes, the Midianites and the Malachites, were coming, just like in the other story with Jehoshaphat. Again, two tribes with a massive number of soldiers were coming towards his camp. And God was picking a leader to deliver the camp of where, of where, where Gideon was. But he's trying to, he's got to get this doubt out of Gideon's mind because what does God, what does Gideon do in verse 36? Now, he's got the assignment of knowing that that they're coming. Now, verse 36. Then again, Gideon said to the Lord, if you will deliver Israel through me, as you've spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. 
If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you've spoken. Now, he's, he's almost saying, he's almost saying, well, okay, Lord, if you want to use me as a soldier, I want to know, I want to make sure. If it's really you, what do you say? Make, make there only be dew on the fleece and keep the ground under dry. And God did exactly that. Now, you would have thought, okay, 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 you're right, Lord. But no, no. Here he goes again. And verse, 10, verse 36, and, and it was so. When he arose the next morning and they squeezed the fleece, it, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. That's how much he did. The Lord did exactly what he said. Then, verse 39, he says it again. Then Gideon said to God, do not let your anger burn against me, but <laughs> like, Lord, I don't, don't get, get mad at me, Lord. <laughs> yeah, look, against me, that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry and the ground under it be wet. Again, the Lord did it again. So now here he requested, okay, Lord, if you want to use me as a leader, you, you got to show me that you really want me to do this. So first was make the wheat, make the lead fleece wet and the ground dry. That wasn't enough for him. And then again, he says, well, this time make the fleece dry and the ground wet. And God did both of those things. And Gideon suddenly, oh, duh, I'm going to be a leader now. See, these are cases where this is a perfect example of getting too intellectual. Now, God knew this was about uh, Gideon. So he, he understood He understood that I'm going to need to work on this guy. This guy has what it takes to lead the army to what I need to do to show my glory in the victory. But right now I got to work on this guy's head because he doesn't believe he's the leader he is. And see, that's what sometimes we have to go through. God puts us through different tests through where we're thinking we're being punished, but he's putting through some hardships because he's trying to use us down the road in some way where we need to be stronger. But right now we're going through, we're doing, a, we're going through a Gideon. Well, are you sure you want to use me? Are you sure you want to speak through me? Uh, Lord, can I really do that? Lord, yes, I'm already chosen you, but right now I got to convince you that you could do that, which is what's happening to Gideon. Now, <laughs> now it wasn't enough that God finally told him. Now, I did a Bible study uh, at home with the Word as well on this lesson, but but the point I'm bringing this back for Golden Nuggets is because this is all about obedience. This is obedience training what's going on right now, because once Gideon has made this victory in this lesson, he will... He probably walked out. Matter of fact, he peace reigned for 40 years after this victory that he got. So not only did Gideon say, but after he got all that out of his way, then the Lord told him in verse um verse 7. Um no, 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 no. no what the, the tribes are on the way. Let's jump down to verse 3. Now we already know the tribes are on the way. No, go let's go to verse 1. And then uh, verse 1. And then Jerubal, that is Gideon, all the people who were with him, rose early, camped by the spring, and the camp by the Midians, was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. Verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many into, uh, uh, to give Midian into their hands. For Israel will come boastful, saying, my own power delivered me. See, God sometimes wants to use less of what you think you need. To show his power through you. Otherwise, you think, look at me, look at what I did. No, no. God will show you how much power you have with less. So that way, when you get the victory, you can say, but God. That's what he's teaching right now. So, so Lord says, You have you got too many men. My power has delivered me. So if you got all your men, you'll say, Look at what I've done. But if you have less men that you think you need. God will get the glory. So sometimes we have to remember, God must always get the glory. Verse 3, now therefore, proclaim, the heart, proclaim in the hearing of the people, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return, depart from Mount Gilead. And he's talking to all his soldiers. So 22,000 people left. They returned home. See, not everybody wanted to fight. But back in those days, when a war took place, all the men had to fight, period. But then the Lord said, I don't need all these men because I'm going to move in this. I don't need all these men because I'm going to be the one moving. So tell whoever wants to go home, go home. And 22,000 people left. Now, Gideon could have panicked and, and said, what? 
10,000 pe- 10, soldiers remained. 22,000 just left. Now, later in the word, you find out that the enemy is 120,000 soldiers. That's, that's who's on the way. And God just said, tell whoever to go home, to go home. And 22,000 left when you know that 120,000 soldiers is who the enemy has. Keep going. He's got 10,000 people left. Verse 4. God says, the people are still too many. <laughs> 22,000 people just left. 120,000 coming. You got 10,000 left. And God just said, you still got too many people. 10,000 is too many people against 120,000. Now, did Gideon get crazy? No. Okay, okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. See, this is obedience taking place. This is obedience taking place. He could have very easily, just like back in the fleece example, he could have kept asking God questions. But how am I going to do this? He didn't ask that. He just kept, okay, Lord, who wants to go home? 22,000 leave. Now, 10,000 left. And God says in verse 4, there are still too many people. Bring them down to the water. And I will test them for you. I will test them for you. There. Therefore, it shall be upon, uh, uh, therefore, it shall be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, and he shall go with you. But everyone of whom I say, this one shall not go with you. So he brought the people, verse 5, he brought the people to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, you shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue like a dog, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. You know, those who kneel to drink and they cup the water. Some people put their face in the water and lapped it like a dog. The other people brought the water to their face on their knees. That's how he separated the next move. And so God says, now, verse 6, now the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will deliver you with 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let the other people go home. Wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. Okay. I went from 22,000 just went home. I got 10,000. And you told me to take them to the water. Those who lapped the water. Those who knelt to water. And 300 lapped the water. You keeping 300 to go against 120,000? He could have gotten mental again. 300 versus 120,000. Now, sometimes that's the way we look in today's life. We look at a problem going, how am I going to do that? That's why we say the words, but God. See, we don't worry about how we're going to do that. If the Holy Spirit said, all I need is 300 people, all I need is 300 people, don't you say, but, 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 now we say, but God the wrong way. But God, I, don't I need more? No. Holy Spirit says, God said, I need to get the glory. If I give you more men, you're going to think you got the glory. No, no. I'm going to give you so little that you think you can't win and show you the power of God. That's what this whole test is about. Show you. Watch me work. See the salvation of the Lord. That's what we're seeing right here. See the salvation of the Lord. All right. Now, now, last part. So, so got the 300 people. Now, now this is what just like a Jehoshaphat story. When God moves in situation, he moves in a way that you think that, that, <laughs> You, you don't even know how it's going to be done. Now, again, now Gideon didn't complain. Gideon did not complain when he got down to 300. But God knew. See, it doesn't say this in the word. But God, God knew that Gideon probably has some fear. So what he does from verse, verse 9, it came to the Lord to tell Gideon, Arise, go down to the camp, for I have given it to you into your hands. But if you're afraid to go down, go with pure, your servant down to the camp. He's telling them, and this is this is kind of, he's telling them, go, go down and just, just listen to what the enemy is talking about because I need you to understand that you got this victory, but you don't know that. So I need you to go down and just kind of listen to what the camp's talking about. So he sneaks down the camp. Now, verse 11, and what you will hear, what they say, and afterward, your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. So he went down with Pura, his servant, down to the outpost, of the army that was in the camp. Now, verse 12. Now, the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number. Just to give you an idea, I don't know if you ever seen a locust storm, but a locust storm makes the sky look black. That's how many soldiers and camels there were. Okay, as numerous, the, the, 
the camels were without number and as numerous as the sands on the sea. When Gideon came down, verse 13, a man, a man was relating a dream to his friend. He said, behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was, was tumbling into the camp and it came to the tent and struck it so that I, it fell and it turned upside down. And so the tent laid flat. And his friend said in the soldiers, this is nothing less than the, the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. Now, this was a person deciphering the dream of a soldier who was wondering why he had this bad dream. What he was actually having a dream was, was the defeat they were about to face. Now, fear already set in once his friend said, that dream is about, verse 14, the sword of Gideon. And all the camp has been delivered to his hand. So now once the person who deciphers the dream tells the other person, your dream is about us being defeated. Now, the guy is already, fear comes in. Because here they are over 120,000. <laughs> they don't even know that Gideon has just had 300. But fear has already set in. Fear has already set in. Because once that guy says, once the decipherer of the dream says, that's the hand, that, that's the sword of Gideon. He's going to be delivering us into his hand. They know about the power of God. See, sometimes our enemy also knows about the power of God more than we do. That's why we must know who we are in Christ. My very first golden nugget was don't let the unbeliever fear God more than you. Because the unbeliever knows about the power of God. They just don't believe in him. But they've heard about it. They've read about it. They hear people praying about it. Sometimes an unbeliever fears God more than we who follow him. And that's what we must always remember. Don't let an unbeliever say, well, in your God going to be mad? Why should an unbeliever be telling me, isn't my God going to be mad? I should be saying that. But if an unbeliever is fearing God more than we who follow him, there's a problem there. Now, to make a long story short, the last part, verse 16. Verse 16. But I'll read this in entirety on your own. Verse 16. He divided 300 men into three companies. He put the trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them and torches against the pigs. Wait a minute. Where are the weapons? Wait a minute. He, he, say, he didn't say grab your swords and your shields. He said he, he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all the men and torches. It didn't say swords. It didn't say shields. It said trumpets, empty pitchers, and, and then torches. And that's what you're taking the battle against 120,000 soldiers? Uh, he didn't ask any questions. He didn't ask any questions. He's being obedient. See, God is showing him how to get the victory. But he said, torches, trumpets, pitchers against 120,000 soldiers? How am I going to do that? He didn't say that. He did it. He didn't say that. He obeyed and did it. Now, they, so verse 16, when I, and this is, he's telling the soldiers, when I and all who are with you blow the trumpet, then you blow your trumpet all around the camp. So basically what he did, what he did, he put the men in three points around the soldiers in the valley. He put the people, his soldiers, his 300, in three different locations around the valley so that when they blew their trumpets, look, 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 look at this, uh, verse 19. So when Gideon and the 300 came to him, to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just posted the watch, they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. When the three companies blew their trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their hands and the trumpets in the right hand for blowing and cried a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. They started to praise. So they're making noise, praising. Not a single spear was thrown. Not a, not a shield was being touched. They're praising, blowing trumpets, breaking pitchers and shouting praise. And each stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran, crying as they fled. When they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord set the sword one against the other, even throughout the entire army. And the and the army fled as far as uh, Bethita towards Zarephath, as far as the edge of Abel Mahola by Tabith. Now stop right there. Let's right there. Now, what you'll see is later in this chapter, they all, who, the soldiers that did not turn themselves against themselves to kill each other, the other ones fled. They didn't, just like before, 
they did not have to fight this fight. 300 over 120,000. Now, look right, the verse, just to let you understand the numbers, jump to uh, chapter 8, verse 10. But please read chapter 6, 7, 8 to get the whole story of what I missed. Now, at, when I got to the, uh, the edge of the, of the valley, now Zabbath and Zalmoma were in Korah, and their armies with them, about 15,000 men who were left of the entire army of the sons of the east, for the fallen were 120,000 men. 100 out of that entire army, 120,000 killed each other, and there were 15,000 left who were running away. So this is the power of the God. This is the power of the Lord. When he could have been asking all these questions, all I need is 300 men. When you know over 120,000 are attacking you, but the Lord says, all I need, all I need is 300. Now, what you need might be more, but God says, all I need is 300 to defeat over 120,000. So what for the 120,000 that were killed, the ones who were still living were running away. See, that's the power of God. That's what we say, but God. That's what we say, thank you, Jesus. Because when he's moving in your situation, when he's moving in your situation, that's why you have no fear. Because once God is in the mix, and almighty God, we know who's got our back in whatever situation we're going through, there is no fear. That's why whenever you go into fear, you're not remembering who's got our back. When you go into depression, negativity, heaviness, feeling like you can't make it, you're forgetting who's got your back. Almighty God, who gave these people the victory, 300 over 120,000 in Jehoshaphat, they just started praising and the, and the enemy started killing each other. When you're trusting God, you're not worrying about how he's going to do it. You're trusting God. How he's going to heal me? Trust God. How am I going to get the victory? Trust God. How am I going to get out of this situation? Trust God. The answer is trust God. That's that's the answer to the question. Don't get intellectual. Into, lean not. Lean not. Say with me. Lean not to your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. Your own understanding can cause chaos in your own life. Behold the enemy and he is me, because when you lean to your own understanding, you become your own enemy. You cause your own fear out of your own mouth, because when you don't trust the Lord, you're now trusting the words out of your mouth, which is, how am I going to do that? Don't worry about it. But God is how you're going to do it. But God is the answer. Trust, trust in all our ways. We acknowledge him and he will direct our path. If you remember nothing else, I'll say this several verses I've said this, that phrase, he will direct our path. He will direct our path. All we need is trust. Thank you, Jesus. You got this. Don't worry about how. God's got this. Because he's, if I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, not my riches, his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, which is unlimited riches, unlimited knowledge, unlimited answers to our problems. We, we, we don't even see one answer. But because his ways are higher than our ways, God, God's got a multiple choice. Do I see him this way, this way, this way, or that way? We don't even see a choice. That's why we can't fear. God sees multiple choice when we don't even see one. That's when fear comes in. We're looking, walk by faith, not by sight. We don't see an answer. We don't see a way out. But God's got multiple choice. God's got multiple ways of getting us out of one problem when we don't even see one way out. That's why we have to hold on to God's unchanging hand so he can lead us the way we need to go to get out. That's where the trust comes in. We don't know which way to go. We don't know. I was going to say fear of uh, false evidence appearing real. I now finally remember that. Fear means this way to remember fear. False evidence appearing real. The lies the devil is going to try to make us make us have fear because it's not there. But he's trying to distract us. He's trying to bring the doubt. He's trying to make us ask questions and and doubt the Lord. That's why we feed the 
feed faith by praising. When you when you're praising, you're feeding your faith because praise God anyhow. God's got this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm praising God for the victory. Thank you, Lord, for the victory. That's why we speak the victory. Because we're rebuking the spirit of doubt by speaking victory. When we feel doubt, speak victory. You feel depressed, speak joy. You feel illness. Even if you're feeling sick, you're going through infirmities in your body, still speak healing. You, we don't know when the healing's coming. But when you feel the infirmity attacking you, still speak healing because the body's going to go through what the body's going through and like however god's going to use us in our body however god's going to use us in our body to be a blessing to someone else like i told you before if i had not hurt my back i would never have prayed god's healing our power and so many people have been blessed by god's healing our power i was only praying for my back i had no idea god was going to use that but he said put it online okay lord put it online see i didn't see why god why you want me to put that prayer online? I prayed for an hour for my back. I recorded it for me to listen to. God said, put it online. I could have said, well, God, why am I going to put it online? Because I'm just praying for my back. God said, put it online because I'm going to use that prayer to bless others. And now that prayer has over 2 million views and testimonies of people who said they've been healed by just playing that prayer, that one hour prayer every day, and it's been a blessing to them. I had no idea what God was going to do with that. I didn't ask him, what you going to do with that, Lord? If I put it online, what you going to do with it? No, God said, put that prayer online. I'm going to use it. Put it online. And bask in his presence. Same way I was trying to teach myself how to pray for an hour. Bask in his presence. God said, put it online. Because other people want to know how to pray for an hour. Put that on a prayer. That's over a million views. See, God knows what he wants to do with us before we know what he wants to do with us. He's leading us to where we need to be when we don't even know where we're going. He already knows. Jeremiah 29, 11. He knows the plans. We don't know the plan. But when we trust him, like I said before, wherever he's taking us, it's going to be better than where we're trying to get right now on our own without him. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. See, I've learned the hard way. I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you it was easy. God put me in the belly of well a couple times for I understood it's much easier to obey the Holy Spirit than be dis disobedient. Just like Jonah the first time. I did some Jonah. I, had some, I had definitely had a couple of Jonah's experiences when God told me to do something and I hesitated. And he put me in the belly of the well. But God, I'm going to church. I'm tithing. I'm praying. What am I not doing? You're not doing what I told you to do. And so, obedience, better sacrifice. What am I doing? God tells me to do something. I'm giving a checklist. If I go to church, I tithe, I did this, I did that. But you're not doing what I told you to do. That's why I was going through the hardship. I was going through the hardship because God told me to do something. I was telling him all these other things I'm doing, but I wasn't doing what he told me to do. And that's what the season of this particular hardship I'm talking about. I, once I understood, oh, that's why when I was writing the, the, the deliverance about deliverance from pornography, the book I wrote about that, I didn't want to write that book because I didn't want people to know that I even had the struggle, the stronghold. I didn't want to heal anybody because if I told you I was victorious over the spirit of pornography, you had to know I was addicted. I didn't want people to know about the addiction. The devil had my mind locked because if I can't deliver somebody, if I didn't tell them I have victory over it, so therefore the stronghold the devil puts in your head, he wants to use you in your struggle and your testimony. But we get so convicted, well, I can't let people know I went through that. I can't let people know that was my past. But now you're not, that's old things have passed away. That's not you anymore. Behold, all things become you, new. And now God wants to use your testimony of who you used to be to show people you can get out of that lifestyle through the word of God and walk in victory. He wants to use that testimony to be a blessing. The world wants you to make you feel guilty. The, the world judges you. You used to do that. That used to be you. Uh, uh. The Holy Spirit says, no, I want to use that. Because I, like, I got a lot of other people I want to deliver with your testimony. That's how the Holy Spirit works. He wants to use our testimony to be a blessing to others who are stuck in the same situation that we used to be struggled in. And now he uses us to show others how to walk in that victory. Amen. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this lesson today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for just blessing every fellowship member right now, Lord. Thank you for just touching Everyone right now that can hear my voice, Lord, to give them victory in their areas right now, Lord. Thank you, Father God. We just thank you for just touching and being right here, right now, God, in all the things we're dealing with in this world, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you. Just bless every fellowship member right now, Lord. Touch them in their area of whatever they're going through right now, Lord. Bless them in every way, Lord. That we've learned that obedience is better than sacrifice, Lord. To be obedient to your voice. Be obedient into what you're trying to get us to do, Lord. Sometimes we don't see the answers, Lord. But help us to understand that trusting you, 
believe in you, holding your hand every step of the way to get us out of whatever we're dealing with right now. The struggle is real, but by my God is real. Woo, thank you, Jesus. The struggle is real, but so is my God. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And with God, all things are possible. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Help us, Lord, to hold on to that promise. Hold on to those verses, Lord, because we understand, Lord, it is you. Thank you, Lord. It is you who gives us the victory over everything we're facing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right now, thank you, Lord, Father God. I want to bind every spirit of retribution, revenge, retaliation from coming against any fellowship member because of their participation in this fellowship. Father God, bind every spirit of retribution, revenge, retaliation, and every other demonic spirit, named the unnamed, seen the unseen, and we cast them all out of our mind, out of our presence, out of our home, back to the pit of hell from whence they came. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for moving in that situation right now, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Right now, Father God, loose, loose into fellowship, loose, unspeakable joy, loose, peace beyond understanding, loose restoration, Lord. Restore, restore, restore every area of our life, Lord. Restore. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, Lord, loose, supernatural healing. By your stripes, we are healed. We are healed. We are healed. And we agree right now, Lord, to speak healing every single day of our life. No matter how it looks, no matter what it feels like, we keep speaking healing over every situation, everything we're dealing with in our life, Lord. Loose, oh yes, Lord, supernatural overflow, abundance, let your blessings rain down in the fellowship, rain down right now on the fellowship, Lord. You shall supply all our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, not our riches, but your riches, Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want for anything when the Lord is my shepherd. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I like fighting, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you for our miracle. Our miracle, Lord. We've been praying for so long, for years in some cases, Lord. But we don't give up, Lord, because we knew in due season, we will weep if we faint not. If we don't give up, Lord, because we don't know the when. We don't know the when. But we know it's on the way because when we pray, we believe we have received it. So every day, Lord, we wake up thanking you, Lord. We wake up praising you, Lord, because we know that any day we open our eyes the next day, that could be the day of the manifestation of our healing, the victory, the miracle we've been praying for for so long. That's why we wake up excited, Lord, because we don't know. But we know. <laughs> yes, Lord, we know it is on the way. And we thank you in advance for the, hit, the release of every single miracle right now. In Jesus' name.